Welcome to the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK, a show that tries to shed a little light on the darkness of suicide. Chuck Seabrass unable to be with us today, but more than making up for it, from the great state of Michigan, Tamara Sutton. How are you doing, my dear? I am so happy to be here and wishing everyone a happy holiday. Oh, very good. Always a pleasure to have you on. And, of course, Citizen Mike, the nucleus, the heart, the the machine, the cog in the machine that is the Suicide Prevention Show. Citizen Mike, how are you doing? Would somebody please get the paddles? I think I need to be revived. <laughs> <laughs> it's always great to be here with you guys. <laughs> and, of course, we have, uh, as we often do, a very special guest in the studio with us today. Who are we visiting with today? Today we're visiting with Ruth. You know, when we started these stories of recovery, we got to meet Susie, and she was absolutely fabulous. And she came to us from NAMI DuPage, Speakers Bureau. And uh, anyway... Susie has introduced us to a whole slew of other friends, and today we have Ruth with us to talk with us about her story of recovery. Welcome to the studio, Ruth. Thank you, and I worked with Susie a lot when we both started the program. So. Oh, wow. So one of the things we want to do is ask you to, to describe yourself to our audience so that they have some kind of picture of who you are, and, and not that they would ever meet you directly, but if they met somebody like you, what might they see? Okay. Um, I'm a daughter, a sister, um, mother, a grandmother, um, a wife three times, um, and uh, I like doing crafts like ceramics and crocheting, and I like doing volunteer work. Fabulous. You know, and I like the way she started this out because she talked about the relationships. And that is like so important to me and so important to our show because we talk about changing the world one conversation at a time and shedding a little light in an area. And business. all the different roles. And Tamara, you can speak to that too, being a mother and then being a professional woman and uh, so many things going on. And a family first, of course, foremost, but lots of different aspects in your life. Oh my gosh, yes. And it, you know, sometimes it's very confusing. So I'm anxious to hear. Ruth's story and how she juggled all of those different roles and relationships. Very good. Carries. So Ruth, tell us, Ruth. Please where, tell us. Tell us about your story of recovery. Okay. Um, I probably had my uh, bipolar disorder um, since I was a teenager, but my first crisis was in uh, 1984, two days before Christmas. Oh, wow. And... I went to the hospital, and my body was shaking. I was crying uncontrollably. I um, had a migraine headache, stayed in the emergency room for six hours, and then they transported me to another hospital. Okay. And was that other hospital then you were in a, another emergency room? or? No, or? they transferred me right to the psychiatric floor. Okay. And I... When I got there, um, they just did the uh, cavity search and took away anything that they thought I could harm myself with. And I didn't understand any of this at the time. Um, so when I was on that unit in the middle of the night, I went up to get to the bathroom and the door was locked. And they told me I was on suicide watch. Oh, wow. I mean, it sounds very intrusive and, and yeah. frightening. It's kind of like you were taken totally by surprise. Yeah, but at that point, I just wanted to be fixed. But, Ruth, you sound a little like you were upset about it. Were you, were you looking back in hindsight, were you treated the way you feel that you should have been treated when you were checked into the emergency room, or what did they do wrong, and how would you have them do that differently? Well, when I was checked into the emergency room, they just basically let me sit there for hours on end, never tried to give me any food or offer me Tylenol or anything. And then when I was transported by ambulance, I didn't know where I was going, why I was going. So um, it was an uncomfortable situation. And uh, so after that, um, I had many years of being depressed and going through different kinds of um, medications. For 10 years, I went to the same psychiatrist with no uh, relief. Oh, wow. And his final solution was to do 
ECT treatments. What is that? That's electric convulsive treatments, shock treatments. Wow. So you were saying after 10 years, did you both decide that this wasn't working? Because we've learned doing this show that a lot of times the doctor-patient relationship, would cert- it doesn't work, and it's not working. And, and obviously a different doctor might have been a, a solution, but at this point, was it a desperation move to try something like that? Well, what happened is I knew I didn't want to go back to that hospital. So the next time I started having symptoms, um... I went to another hospital, and the doctor I got there um, was very understanding, knew why I didn't want the ECT treatments again, and he says, you have a very difficult disease to treat, and he says, just be patient, and I'll work with you, and and we'll eventually get you to a state that you can live with. What a relief that must have been to hear that, in contrast to what you had already been through in the prior 10 years. Yes, it was a relief to hear that. Um, It wasn't bad to take either, that he was a good-looking doctor. (laughs) That goes a long way. (laughs) Okay, we get that that helps. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Um, and he's still my doctor to this day, Uh, but a year after that, I had a suicidal plan, and a friend saw that, and they got me to the hospital. And then I got more inpatient treatment and outpatient treatment, and I was able to move on from there. And what you, it sounds as though this visit to the hospital um, was different, much different than the first. Yes, I think I expected uh, a little bit more this time. I knew that I would have to go through the body search and everything, so that wasn't as demeaning. Uh, so that was easier for me to take. I didn't take anything that I knew they might take from me, mm-hmm. so that made it easier on me. Did you feel a little more empowered the second time? I'm wondering if having more information helped you to feel a little more participatory or in control on that second visit as opposed to the first. And the reason I'm asking this is I think that so many people, if it, although it's different, you know, 10, 20 years ago, it was very different I'm, I'm right. from what I've heard. But having information is so empowering that you're a part of the process rather than being a victim of the process. Um, it was empowering. And the fact that as I was having problems with different medications and my doctor kept trying different medications, he just kept saying, I know you're hurting, but we're helping you with the tools I know I have. And if this doesn't work, I have more tools. So, yes, it was more empowering, you know, going in the hospital the second time and having a doctor that I could work with. Mm-hmm. And, and felt he was very resourceful right. on your side. Right. In all, I've been hospitalized five times, but um, the first one was the worst, I'd say. Um, and maybe the second one wasn't that great either because I got lithium toxic. Um, and I'm on lithium now, which is funny <laughs> it, but is the lithium working for you now the lithium is working for me but then i'm on an mao okay drug that also works wow. for stabilizing i have been having a hard time recently i went to my doctor last week on monday he gave me some medicine and he says try this if this doesn't work we'll see what else we can do so. so, but one of the things he was doing with you, it sounds like, is informing you and also kind of letting you know that there isn't a, let's say, one pill fixes everyone or one solution fits everyone. And it sounds like he was communicating to you a willingness to stay on this journey with you and help you solve the problems as you go along. So listening to what your symptoms were, what's going well, what's not going well, and trying to figure out what's going to be helpful to you. 
Is that accurate, or am I reading too no, much into it? No, that is uh, accurate. I mean, I go ahead, and I have a very good relationship with this doctor, and um, he knows that when I tell him something, it's not that I'm playing games. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you said 10 years and then another year. That's like 11 years. How did you survive with that? And it sounds to me like you were dealing with depression much of that time. Right. How did you, how did you survive with it? Well, first of all, I had three children living at home, the youngest being four. Okay. Um, so when you're a mom, you do what you have to do to get by. Okay. Uh, there were times I was driving down the street because... I had appointments and like that, and I shouldn't have been driving down the street because the medications had affected me that much. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, I worked in every place I could to try and get help um, so that my children could have a place to live, have food on the table, and me bring in an income without overdoing it. No. Uh, Ruth, you said you had a, a suicide plan at one point. Can I, if it's not too sensitive, can you tell us what that was and, and what you planned to do at that time? Okay. For the very first time, I had bought myself a Ford Ranger truck. I wanted that truck so bad. And then I was living near two lakes that were easy to drive a vehicle into. And... So, my plan was to drive my truck right into the lake. I'd die with my truck, and I'd be happy. All the pain would be gone. Wow. Wow. You know, that's one of the other things that we hear is, is any, in, you know, I listen to you talk in terms of having the courage to be a mother to provide for your children, while at the same time going through 10, 11, and even more years of feeling so trapped that the only way that you could ex imagine yourself experiencing any relief was through death. And yeah. yet you found a way to get through that. Yeah. Fortunately, I had a good friend. Tell us about the friend. It's, uh, the friend was a man that was at least 20 years older than me. Okay. And we had lots of fun together. We used to go dancing together and... And he fell very much in love with me, but he was married. Oh, okay. And, but he didn't want to see anything happen to me. So he talked to me for hours about calling my psychiatrist before we actually called. He told the psychiatrist what was going on. The psychiatrist made him put me on the phone, talk to me. And we decided I should go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, here again, we hear the key piece in terms of relationship. I know a while back we were talking with Paul Quinnett from the QPR Institute and talking about how to save lives from suicide completion. And one has to do with asking the question. But then the other has to do with responding to the person and staying with them until you can help them get help. And it sounds to me like you had a caring person in your life that would listen and that would uh, engage you in a process to try to help you get the help that you're looking for. Right, because he didn't want to see anything happen to me. Yeah. And again, we're finding out it doesn't have to be a doctor who is a good listener. Oftentimes it's a friend, uh, somebody that you can entrust uh, your feelings with and, and get that, that real uh, feedback that you need. We have to take a quick break here right now. You're listening to the Suicide Prevention Show. I want to remind people you can go to our website, 1360wlbk.com. You'll see something that looks like a stop sign. Click on that icon. That will allow you to do what, Citizen Mike? That will allow you to uh, click on an uh, icon where you can download this show and other shows that we have archived up there, as well as find information about uh, suicide um, prevention. And you can also email us to tell us what you think about the show, provide suggestions of the show, and that sort of thing. We'll take a break, come back and visit with Ruth some more here on the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK. Okay, guys, we got to stop asking questions. Yeah, that was about, <laughs> that was about 15 minutes. I know, I know I we know. have to. So we're going to let you go. All right. So okay, we'll just Is that okay? All right. So we're, essentially what we're going to do is to ask you to 
uh, pick up from where you left off after being hospitalized and tell us your story of recovery. Okay. And we're going to be quiet for yes. the most part. Yes. Are we all, the we three of us promise. All right, here we go. We're going to count back down here wait, again. Wait, wait, wait. Are you good to go? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, here yes. we go in three, two, one. Welcome back to the Suicide Prevention Show here on 1360 WLBK. We've been visiting with Ruth, and Ruth has been courageous enough to come in and tell us about her story of survival. And, Ruth, when we last left you in your story, we were at the, the hospital for the second time. Uh, uh, please pick up the story from there, if you would, please. Okay. When I was at the hospital for the second time, uh, I got released to my sister, and... Um, then I was signed up for the outpatient program, which I went to for six weeks. And the outpatient program gave us skills to build our strength, um, not become the victim anymore. Um, it gave us skills on what we needed to do to take care of ourselves, like arts and crafts, uh, spirituality, those kind of things. Um, from there, I just kind of want to go into my treatment plan so that, um, people realize part of the things that go into a treatment plan. My treatment plan consists of, um, seeing my therapist every two weeks. I see my psychiatrist every three to six months unless I get into trouble and I call him sooner. I attend support groups and run a support group. Um, I get blood tests regularly to check the lithium level and some of the other medications. Um, I also talk to my primary care doctor about things that I have problems with and maybe they're physical and not the psychological. And then other than that, um, it's basically talking on the phone to people and um, being able just to talk sometimes is all I need. Um, but you're working hard at your recovery. It sounds like there's many, many steps involved uh, with the recovery process and continuing those steps. Right. And part of that that you're talking about are finding activities that make life worth living for you, as well as staying in contact with the uh, uh, providers that ha you have found to be very helpful to you. Right. Um, and I have many different types of providers because I have a pacemaker and I have uh, stomach problems and sleeping problems, um, not all related to uh, my psychological condition but I find that if I go ahead and eat right and sleep on a regular schedule maintain a schedule exercise and keep friends around that helps a lot um, one of the things I have done to um, get by is I was volunteering at the township senior center and I was uh, basically a greeter. Um, it got me out of the house and gave me something to do. Um, and I walk with my mom uh, for about 15 minutes a day. And uh, I made hats and scarves for children in the township at Christmas time. Uh, doing these in our own voice presentations is what's been good for me. Um, and accepting my illness has been a big part of it. Once I realized that I actually had an illness and learning about it as much as I could, and the way I did that is by going to support groups and finding people that would talk about that. And so um, that made it much easier for me to accept my illness and you actually run a support group of your own now right. as well. In 2004, I uh, started a support group with Carol. It was NAMI-based, but it's changed its name several times because of the structure that NAMI National has come up with. Um, but I also go to other support groups. And uh, one of the support groups I go to is Al-Anon. Uh, because my husband is a recovering alcoholic, and um, sometimes I just need that positive f 
for um, to go ahead and um, get my life back on track. You know, part of what you're talking about there, though, too, is part of the benefit of going to support groups is to get the valid information about dealing with a particular illness, whether it's bipolar disorder or whether it's living with an alcoholic person in the household or whatever else it is. A lot of times it's much more complex than we might think it is. And so being able to surround ourselves by people who are going through similar issues in their lives and that have uh, valid information can be very helpful to us. Right. Um, so last but not least is my successes, hopes, and dreams. Um, my successes are working as a volunteer, and now I am working part-time for NAMI DuPage. And another success is that I can judge when things are getting too much and know when to, to withdraw. And um, my dream is that we will eventually get rid of the stigma dealing with mental illness so that everyone can get the help they need. And Ruth, I think I could add successfully uh, raising three children as well. Uh, it certainly <laughs> should be added on your accomplishments. And if I could ask a, a, a rather personal question, how have you dealt with this with your, with your family and your, and your children? What, what have you told them? And if I could ask, how, how did you tell them about that? Okay. First of all, my youngest son is bipolar, ADHD, and schizophrenic. So he knows what I go through. I know what he goes through. My middle son, um, the sun rises and sets on him. And he's the one that's going to take care of me in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> relationship 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 there you go and uh and then my uh daughter um she is a nurse i don't think she understands my illness at all and is not willing to accept it mm. so that's part of the reason i'm going to be living with my son mm. Uh, but do you think partly concern. she just doesn't want to believe that? She does not my mother and know that she can't have a problem like that and just in denial. Well, I'm she's sure she's in denial. But um the other part of it is uh that she's not willing to accept that I have an illness. It can be difficult for us to accept uh, our parents having an illness, even if it's a physical illness. But then on top of that, when you're talking about a mental illness, it's much more difficult for people to see. It can be even more difficult. But, you know, I really want to highlight what uh, Titi was saying earlier. You're talking in terms of your successes. You're telling us this started when you were a teenager and you were first hospitalized in 1984. Mm -hmm. So for, we know, for 23 years right. since you were hospitalized the first time, you've been able to battle a debilitating disease, one that would cause you to feel like you wanted to end your life, that you're better off dead than alive, and you've raised three kids, and you have done this by structuring these activities in your life, and, and I looked on the list you're talking about. You're also giving back to the community. You're talking about volunteering for people that are elderly. You talk about making crafts and giving it away. That, that is a trooper. I mean, that, that is the epitome of success from the way I can, I can see it, because you have an illness that, that is much more difficult than most people can imagine living with, and you've done well with it. Thank you. So was there anything else you wanted to add uh, about your current situation and your hopes and dreams? Okay. My current situation is I'm married to my husband for the second time. He was an active alcoholic the first time. And then he got sober, and I didn't want to get involved with him again, but I ended up doing that, and he loves me very much. But he also suffers from an illness besides the alcoholism. He has um, depression. Mm -hmm. And so being able to recognize it in him right. makes it easier for me 
to address it with him. He doesn't always want to speak about it, mm -hmm. but... I mean, I think that can also be difficult for him. Does he acknowledge that he also has depression, or does he kind of deny that? No, he acknowledges he has depression. And like the other night, he went ahead, and I saw him go from making jokes to sitting in the chair with his hand or his chin in his hand and looking like he lost his last friend mm -hmm. and he wouldn't tell me what it was and then I remembered it's around the time that his first wife died of leukemia mm -hmm. so I think that's what it was but I'm not going to pressure the issue sure. Well, we talk about the importance of breaking the stigma of talking about mental illness, and you already referred to the fact that your son is going through uh, uh, problems, but you can talk to him about it. He can talk to people. Uh, so that stigma, we're making it go away, are we not? In small pieces. In small pieces. Well, one conversation at a time. That's what we say we're doing it here, too, and that's why right. we commend you for coming on and talking to us. Tamara, I know you want to uh, thank Ruth as well, too, for uh, sharing the story of recovery with us today. Thank you so much, Ruth, for sharing so much of your heart and your history I, I also want to thank you for pointing out that each of us deal with these enormous challenges in life very, very differently. And as long as we're reaching out for our resources, we do find a way. And Citizen Mike, again, we are, are in awe of Ruth and what she's Absolutely. been able to do in her life and to come here and to continue to give back to the community the way she does. Absolutely. And to me, one of the key themes that uh, Ruth is putting on the table is being in relationship with other people, the, having relationships that have helped her learn about her illness and that have encouraged her to keep going, and being in relationship here with us and with our listening audience by sharing such a vulnerable part of your life and so that other people can learn from your experiences. It's, we thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. I enjoyed being here. Thank you, Ruth. And again, we hear it time and time again. Listen to the people. Listen to your friend. What do you always say, Mike? Don't S speak up. Don't remain silent. You speak see up. someone suffering or someone being oppressed. Speak up. Don't remain silent. Ask them about it. Find out what's going on. Give them a listening ear and some support so that they, too, can be troopers like uh, Ruth is. And that's the Suicide Prevention Show for this week. Changing the world one conversation at a time.